Welcome back to Primary Source China Investment. This is show F2. So we're going to get into a number of specific asset classes today. But before we get it kicked off, we wanted to welcome all of our viewers back and hope if you haven't subscribed yet to hit the subscribe button. So this week, we wanted to go through each of the asset classes and talk about what's happening with them, but also the policy involved behind those asset classes, because there's a lot happening. And we wanted to connect the dots for all the viewers and then maybe take a position on where we see things going in the future based on what's happened in the past and based on what's been happening in the dialogue at the government level. So the first asset class is, is currency. Uh, a few months ago, we talked about renminbi was appreciating, but uh, for the last six months or so, it's been very, very stable. And there's probably a reason for that. So regulators are scrutinizing trading desks, ensuring that nothing nefarious is happening. This came to light this week, and you can absolutely see the decrease in volatility over the, fat, uh, over the past few months. And actually, if you look at a year-to-date chart, we're basically back to, to where we began the year. A, a currency is, uh, I think, it's pretty important. Uh, so especially for the exchange uh, uh, rate. So everybody uh, pay attention to that. And uh, that is a big impact uh, for the uh, national uh, um, foreign currency reserve. Uh, so I think uh, the generally the policy goal is they really try to keep the uh, stable um, uh, ex exchange rate. It looks like currency is a, is, a, is a secondary tool or lever that the government can use. So it doesn't look, it looks like things are stable um, from a you know, trade and policy perspective. So that, way, that, that has the knock on effect of having lower volatility in the currency market. Yeah. So uh, the next asset class we wanted to talk about briefly is real estate. And we're going in no particular order, but um, there's been a lot of discussion about real estate. So what can we say that's new? Uh, companies are going to fail. There's no doubt about that. Distressed investors and developers will come in and rebuild. Um, it's clear that the individual will not suffer because their down payments seem to be safe and even their investments in wealth management products are going to be made whole. This is not a great outcome as it continues to reinforce this moral hazard that investors are going to take a lot of risk because they feel like they're going to get bailed out. And this is a confirmation bias of that fact. So I don't think that the bailing out of individual investors is a good idea, but I do think that all of the reinvestment into some of these, what they call lo, like not finished buildings is going to be uh, very good for the new developers that come in and step into Evergrande and Fantasia and all of these other names that are going to go uh, going to go bad. Uh, I think uh, yeah, definitely the recent real, real estate is like a big topic. It's everybody talk about that. Everybody worry about that. No matter you hold the house or you uh, you want to buy it, uh, I think uh, right now it's really changed the people's expectations. So most of the people realize that this uh, uh, housing price cannot be sold uh, in the future and uh, the, uh, reduce the speculations uh, for a, a lot of the market uh, activities. Right. But for the companies, uh, for the real estate uh, uh, company, especially for the, if we see the uh, stock market, real estate uh, uh, sectors get dropped uh, almost 12 months since, uh, 20, uh, since July, 2020. And uh, after that, uh, it uh, started to get a bounce uh, back. So it pretty much bounced for the two months. So that's really the Evergreen uh, um, suffered a uh, bigger loss and uh, get a disclosure for the lot of the inside loss to the market. Yeah, that, that's that's exactly right. There's there's going to be shakeout and not everybody's going to make it. And those, those entities that don't make it, there's going to be vultures that come in and, and pick up those assets on the cheap and, and rebuild them and probably make a lot of money. I was talking to a, a U.S.-based uh, hedge fund that deals in distress, and they actually made a loan uh, recently, six times, uh, six times asset coverage ratio. Well, you, know, you can argue that it's probably the asset coverage ratio is based on some formula of asset value, but uh, it will remain to be seen what those assets, what the values of those assets are. That's true, yeah. Like, like I said, grade, I think the original shareholder probably the equity is uh, down to zero. 
Uh, right. But the, their good asset is, is still like a lot of the institutional investor, they try to buy it. Uh, it's uh, like the investing distressed uh, uh, debt or they, or they just uh, simply purchase the uh, uh, asset, part of the asset from the uh, uh, Evergrande. Uh, yeah. So I see almost hundreds, uh, mm, uh, no, probably tens of the billions uh, uh, transactions already done. So which uh, give Evergrande uh, the new capitals to finish the uh, existing project. Yeah, either it will be Evergrande or it will be another entity that steps in and buys a, a bespoke project, which uh, those, those, those values will not accrue to the equity holders of Evergrande. They may accrue to the bondholders, although it does look like the U.S. bondholders are out of luck. <laughs> U.S. dollar. Uh, yeah. yeah, so everything, <laughs> have to pay attention to the details. <laughs> Correct. Absolutely. That's the... Yeah. That's part of the issue. Nobody wants to talk about nuance, but you know that's what uh, we we get into a lot of the nuance. And this is a good place to switch over to stocks. And you know we've been covering it for weeks. And domestic, when I say domestic, I mean mainland stocks and Hong Kong listed shares are killing those listed overseas. You know those those stocks listed in the U.S. It's hard to imagine that the road ahead for the largest Chinese firms listed in the U.S. will get any easier despite significant sell-offs. And what we mean by that is we keep putting up this chart of ASHR uh, compared to the US listed Chinese stocks. And the biggest one right now is KWEB, but KWEB, but MCHI also, also very big, over 2 billion, something like that. Those have sold off significantly, whereas ASHR I think is down 3% year to date, which again, it's down, but it's not down 20, 30, 40% like some of these other high-flying ETFs are. Uh, uh, that's right. So um, uh, uh, KWeb is uh, really down almost uh, uh, 47% for this year. Uh, but uh, if you see the China Asia is uh, the biggest sector is still like the uh, bank or financial related uh, sector. Yeah. And then um, there's internet uh, uh, related companies that still take the very small percentages. Uh, so I think um, uh, overseas, uh, uh, China-related uh, companies uh, uh, really, I don't think have a big impact for the Asian market, but mm -hmm. obviously uh, uh, is, uh, have a huge impact for the uh, overseas investors. So then probably they really uh, focus on like the internet-related uh, sector that yeah. is give them bigger exposure uh, and, and obviously bring a lot of the risk. Even in the Asia market, if you see the Shanghai Composite Index, it's still okay. It looks like it still get up uh, mm -hmm. for this year. Yeah. Uh, so it's not too bad. This sort of goes into a little bit of the policy explanation I wanted to get into. The, when I see this, it does look like um, you know policy comes at you fast and people talk about things and then they go away, but sometimes they come back. And when I'm seeing this, it does remind me of this dual circulation. If we remember, we, we covered dual circulation in the past and talked about what, what that might look like. But in my estimation, it does look like uh, China is focusing on the domestic market and be damned what happens overseas because all of those stocks that have been hit hard have been listed overseas. So China is focusing on building its national brands, building its uh, supported companies. And this gets into the trade policy as well. We'll get into that in a moment. But this dual circulation of uh, growing China companies locally for local demand is absolutely the plan that's in place. And if they go overseas and if they build great brands and are able to export those brands, great. But it does look like it's uh, for the domestic consumption market now. Yeah, I think the China policy is also have the cycle. It's pretty much like the Fed or like the increased tax or reduced the tax. They all get the cycle. I think right now it's really in pretty tight uh, regulation and the policy period. Mm -hmm. so it lasts uh, for like a couple of months, a couple of years, and then it gets loose again. So it's, uh, if you see the history, it's keep doing like that. Yeah. So the next asset class we wanted to bring up was bonds. So like currency, consistent with little disruption and lower volatility. We, we put up a chart last week. Maybe we have a couple more this week. Um, fixed income's done exactly what it's supposed to do. And obviously fixed income and currency related, but those, uh, these are renminbi denominated uh, bonds 
uh, traded in China? Uh, treasury bond is, uh, still looks good. And the five years and the 10 years bond, uh, overall, if you see the, uh, uh, the ETF, uh, it's still get up and uh, the vol volatility is uh, uh, getting better. Uh, uh, I think overall the bond investment uh, is uh, still just reach the goal, give some of the uh, income and appreciate a little bit. So next up is commodities. And we visited commodities a couple of times in the past when things were really getting you know, asymptotic, but it does look like things have, have calmed down. And CBIRC, the, the main regulator here, issued a ban on lending for commodity speculation, which immediately had the result of dampening volatility. So a lot of people were using a lot of leverage in the commodity space. So CBR, CBIRC you know, issued a ban on this kind of lending. So volatility has come down a lot in the entire commodity space. Uh, commodity is always a high volatility market. Right. Uh, so as we know, and also it have the naturally bring the leverage in the market. Uh, so which makes things worse. Uh, so if you really, but if you see the uh, China uh, Shanghai uh, Industrial Metal Index, so it's a get up for almost 19 months. So you have 19 months. Uh, anytime you enter into this uh, uh, sector, uh, you, uh, you can make the profit. Uh, so it, I think uh, before the commodity market uh, started, a uh, lot of the investors or institution, they, they know that. They, uh, they understand it, but they just don't invest it and don't allocate the money. <laughs> yeah. They just wait, wait, wait. And yeah. Wait for almost 12 months and 19 months up. And then they think about it. Okay, I want to get it. <laughs> yeah, that's a typical retail investor mentality. That's true. Mm. Yeah. So I, I just, uh, on the commodity side, the, the ban is about lending for commodities investing, not the underlying leverage within the contract. So those contracts all have leverage embedded in them. But what people were doing is they're getting a loan to go invest in a leveraged product. So that, that's a pretty, pretty scary thesis, but that's what was going on. CBIRC has banned that. Um, yeah. Next up, we talked about rates a little bit. PBOC is holding rates steady, but has, in, has, uh, has injected a lot of liquidity recently. Uh, rates have been pretty stable as well. Uh, 10 years come off a little bit year to date. Uh, that's, yeah, pretty much like the uh, government, uh, the policy's objective, keep a relative stable uh, market rather than high volatility. Hmm. Yeah. And then, then finally, we're talking crypto as an asset class. And I think the only thing to add here is that China has effectively banned crypto. Um, not really sure what that's going to mean in the intermediate term, but uh, does seem to be something that the, the government's not interested in, in playing around with. Yes, yeah, surprisingly, the cryptocurrency, a uh, lot of the individuals, they talk about that. Uh, I know just uh, from my friends and from my network, uh, they are interested in that one. Yeah. I don't know how they hey, transfer money and uh, invest in that one. Looks like uh, there's many app or uh, many ways to invest in, uh, in uh, cryptocurrency. But obviously, <laughs> except that the couple of the big one and all others uh, definitely uh, <laughs> lose the all, uh, most of the principles. Yeah, it, it, it does. It, and and I, I do think if, if, if this ban has any teeth, there's going to be some high profile cases. Otherwise, people will, you know, jump the wall, if you will, and, and, and go yeah, around. Yeah, looks like from government perspective, cryptocurrency has no any value except the cause of loss uh, to them. Correct, and and they, they do worry about the capital control. I mean, that's a huge, a huge worry. If 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 they all of a sudden allow the free float and free trade of the renminbi, then you know crypto would mean nothing. But the fact that they still have these gates on getting money in and out, then crypto is a way to get around that. So that's why you know you have yeah. an effective ban. So that's we'll true. see if it see if it really works. I mean, we all, we all know how things work in China. Um, yeah. So, so where does that leave the informed allocator, and and what might change? So, she's grip on just about every aspect of the economy: leisure, education, um, finance is is growing firmer by the day. We speculated that this might be pushing for his legacy, but he might just be shoring up his position going into 2022 when his second five-year term expires. Impossible for us to know what, if any, challenges to his position, but the heavy handedness on all of these levers leads us to believe that China is looking inward with laser focus. So what does that mean? 
Well, it means to focus on mainland investment opportunities. It doesn't mean US, it doesn't mean proxy, it means A shares, China fixed income in renminbi and all onshore. That is the only place that we would be recommending allocators to be looking at investment opportunities at this point. Would you agree with that, Penghuo? Would you? Would you? Would you? Would you not? I think yeah. I think uh, a share market is uh, still the uh, totally different from the overseas China related uh, sectors. So their performance, the evaluation, liquidity, uh, it's really like the different animals, and also. Uh, that obviously is uh, uh, country's uh, mm, policies, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, is a goal. Uh, so they try to keep the healthy and uh, uh, development uh, uh, market uh, and also attract the capitals uh, all over the world. Obviously, they add a lot of the regulation and the control on this market. So I think uh, mm, uh, the people should realize the uh, difference into the market and uh, uh, try to figure out what's the short-term policy, what's the really the long-term uh, policy or st strategic goal that they're doing like that. So if they can execute uh, like the strategic goal, a lot of the natural uh, country's resource as well as the market probably will follow this uh, uh, um, policies uh, guidance to, to move in. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree. I, I, I do look at the focus of of the government, the focus of the policy absolutely is on the mainland. And we should also follow policy. As we've always said, investment follows policy in China. And with that, we're going to leave it here. Thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you next week. Thank you.